It's hard to believe that almost 30 years ago, Primrose Hill became a regular sanctuary for me, someplace I would come to for inspiration, to compose and produce a musical version of H.G. Wells' classic science fiction story, The War of the Worlds. I would regularly try and imagine what it was like to live in Victorian England, facing the onslaught of an alien invasion from a super-intelligent force with incredible machines and weapons that mankind, at best, could only defend itself against with rifles and cannons. Humanity in that period must have thought the Martians were the devil incarnate, wreaking havoc on an innocent world. A world with Queen Victoria on the throne at the peak of the British Empire, the Industrial Revolution coming to its end, and the steam engine being the height of technology. Saad's law that now when I was returning to the place of my major inspiration, the day itself was less than inspirational. I mean, look at the bloody weather, will you? Freezing cold with snow and rain fighting each other. I'm wearing so many layers of clothing I could be mistaken for the Michelin Man. But I have to admit, so much has come flooding back to me, not just about HG's amazing story, but also the numerous people I was fortunate to collaborate with. We all came together for a moment in time for a project that was truly a labor of love. So let me take you now through the story of the making of my musical version of The War of the Worlds. The history behind The War of the Worlds is interesting in that it wasn't written as a book. It was originally written as an episodic adventure for a magazine in the late 1890s. And it was written in the same way sort of B-movies used to be made, where they'd leave off at the end of a given moment to get the viewer of the, the B-movie to come back next week for the next chapter. And that's how H.G. originally wrote The War of the Worlds. It turned out to be so popular that it was then re-examined by H.G. and his publisher and was novelized becoming what we all know more of as the War of the Worlds as a, as a complete story. H.G. Wells is a, uh, an author of uh, great vision, uh, and I think if you trace his history, you'll find that he wrote about many different subjects, not just about science fiction stories. And when I first sort of learned about him properly, uh, I was amazed at the depth of the man's intelligence and involvement with so many subjects. He was a visionary, you know, he wasn't just a uh wasn't just a, th a thinker and a dreamer. He, he, was a, he was a clever man. He worked out how feasible a tripod fighter machine is, how long their legs must have been, how far they could have walked. He didn't just blindly write it and hope that it, that it was feasible. He uh, was inventive and innovative and wrote probably the best science fiction books of all time, and that remains the case. My work before the War of the Worlds was as a composer, arranger, producer and conductor uh, of a range of, uh, of projects from movie scores, TV scores, lots of commercials, and uh, uh, certain records that I served in all or some of those capacities. My background is, is, is interesting in that I grew up around musicians, singers, actors, writers, mostly because my dad was a very popular entertainer in the uh, 40s and into the 50s before we, we moved as a family to England. He uh, was the original romantic lead in the West End musical Guys and Dolls when it came to England, ran at the Coliseum Theatre. And my mum was a, a good dancer, ballet, traditional dance, and uh, became a poet and won some awards uh, on the international level of poetry. The idea for the War of the Worlds really came from my dad in that uh, he reminded me that after so many years of working with other artists, writing music for, for different media, that I was always probably most wanting to compose scores for big stories, you know, pieces that were in their entirety a, com a complete work. Uh, and I had done one previously when my dad was producing a West End play based upon Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. It was called Two Cities. And he gave me a really big break in my career and said, would you like to compose the score? Which of course I jumped on and it was great fun to do. And was, this was now some years later that he was saying, you remember those big scores you wanted to do? Um, you haven't done them in a while. Why not 
consider some. And I said, yeah, you're right. I'm having great fun with everything that I was doing. But I did want to sort of challenge myself again. And we agreed to sort of uh, review lots of books out there that might turn themselves into musical interpretation. The works that I remember reading, the stories, the books, uh, were voluminous to start with. But the three that became the final contenders, including The War of the Worlds, was Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and The Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. And The War of the Worlds just got my nod because of the simplicity that I could actually see in the story. It wasn't a very thick book. It was about 150 pages long. And I think probably because H.G. did write it as this episodic adventure, uh, it was easy to cut off moments uh, within a block of the story and compose a sequence. And I followed the chapters exactly as H.G. did. Selecting The War of the Worlds actually turned out to be the easy part Paramount Pictures had already long previously bought the feature film rights, and the original book publication was still in copyright in most territories of the world, although not, not the entire world. And all the remaining rights were with the estate of H.G. Wells. H.G. died in 1946, I believe. And from that point on, we knew at least where to go, and we found the agents that represented the, the estate, or certainly for the War of the Worlds. And had to convince them that what we were trying to do is a true uh, accounting in musical form of H.G.'s story. And our desire was to keep it set in exactly the time that H.G. Wells wrote his story, which was Victorian England, and the characters would all emanate from the book itself. And we did convince them and acquired all of these rights, starting with the making of the musical version. And I certainly, from a composer's point of view, had this sort of vision in my mind. Uh, but at the time, I was on tour as a musical director for uh, the artist David Essex, who I had been working with as producer and arranger for a few years previous to that. And I must have just mentioned casually to David or to his then manager that uh, just acquired these rights and going to set out to do a musical version. And uh, next thing I knew, I received a call from a gentleman named Dick Asher, who at one point was the managing director of CBS Records. And he said, I've heard about the War of the Worlds. We're, we're keen. We're interested. And I said, my gosh. I, I was totally unaware where it had filtered past uh, perhaps the, the theater in Cardiff that we had just been gigging at. And um, he said, no, come in and see me. I said, I know you're going to be touring with David here in, in a few weeks. Let's get together and chat. So I had a very small window of time, really, to gather my thoughts about what we were going to do. And that was sometime in 1974. There was a very important moment in the, the recording and making of The War of the Worlds, and I was, uh, I married my wife Geraldine, and uh, I first met her, in fact, as uh, she was the personal assistant to Paul Russell, who was the head of business affairs, who was the one I actually had to conclude my contract for The War of the Worlds after meeting up with Dick Asher in New York. We've now been married 28 years, have four children, and we're still laughing. The original structure that I presented to Dick Asher was going to be of a single album, no guest artists, no original paintings, and of course by the time it was completed it was a double album with major guest artists and lots of beautiful paintings. Uh, that affected the budget substantially and uh, the amount of time that it took to actually create. Relatively early on in the writing, uh, the scripting, the, the concepts of the, of the characters becoming properly performed roles, I could see this was A, not going to fit onto a single album, and I was getting this sort of very firm idea that the characters should be portrayed in the, in the work and played by, hopefully, you know, very well-established and respected artists in their own field. Therefore, the budget to, uh, to bring them in had to change accordingly. Then we started getting the ideas of, well, let's pick major moments in the recording to show in originally commissioned paintings. Yet again, another expense. My own policy has always been, uh, unless there's some serious justification, is that whatever I put forward as a budget, uh, I would stick by it, and any overage would be down to me. And that's what happened. It was logic to be able to go back to CBS and say, look, it's gone from a single to a double album, so can I have the same again as you've agreed to on the first album, which they agreed to. They also agreed once Richard Burton had confirmed his involvement with the recording to play the journalist, and uh, they contributed with me 50% of, of the budget. And 
After that, all the other costs were down to me. So what started off, in truth, as a, approximately a 35,000 pound single album budget turned out to be a 240,000 pound total cost of which uh, CBS put in about 75, 80,000 and the rest was down to me. Schmuck that I was. <laughs> Across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly, and surely, they drew their plans against us. The Eve of the War is the very first chapter in, in H.G. Wells' novel, and it sets the tone of something that is leaving Mars. And the journalist, played by Richard Burton in our recording, knows this astronomer who is forever looking through his telescopes in his observatory, and uh, one day invites the journalist to come have a look. And what they see is this very first cylinder leaving Mars, although they don't know it's an actual cylinder, they just think it's a green flash uh, coming from, from Mars. The whole chapter really is about the setting of what's about to come. And therefore, to me, it was like an overture, a piece that sets the tone. Uh, the melody is pretty simple. That's what the strings play. You can do it with one finger, etc. But what I wanted was this inner tension throughout the largest part of the piece. And what changes a simple melody, I think, to something that has an underlying tension is I added a pedal note to those opening uh, notes because the chords change from minor to major, but the pedal stays on one note. That's why it's called a pedal note. And the second chord, the major chord, suddenly has a dissonance that's been added and suddenly there's this tension. So instead of, you have. So that bottom note adds the whole element that's not there when you just analyze the simplicity of the melody. It's sort of like a prologue to the whole album. You get little snippets of vocals, you get little snippets of riffs that you might be hearing later on in the album. So it's, it's the opener, it's, it's, the, um, it's the gate to the, to the album that you're going to pass through. Certain characters, they come and go, and the Heat Ray, for example, which is a character created by H.G. Wells, this, this weapon of death, a laser-like weapon that can destroy at a moment's notice, so to speak, and decimate all around. Um, it reappears in many compositions throughout the whole work, and it actually appears as sound playing a melody within the eve of the war, but because we're not told yet that there is this thing called a heat ray, nobody knows when they're first listening to it, you're actually hearing the sound of the heat ray. So it's in the middle part. And then it goes. That's all there is of that middle part, but that, when you listen to it, it's the heat ray. The sound is totally identifiable as the heat ray. And right, here comes the heat ray, all on its little own. There's another one next door. Two of them. And then we go back into um, everybody playing. Fantastic. I knew by the time that we were that I was scoring the entire work and knew that Doreen's script was adapting the opening passage, that our journalist was gonna set the mood with his narrative. But what I wanted to follow was a, was a piece of music that would be definitive, that no matter whether you heard it in the album or out of context to the album, it said the war of the world. Here come the Wii So the end of the eve. And they were scored to be three separate recordings, so you can actually hear them overlap. They're in three different octaves, high, medium, and low. 
and as the last note of the high one is played, it holds its note while this, the medium octave starts its we use and it holds. And then the third one, by the time the third phrase is played, they're all holding that one note. The, evening as though it were just like any other. the first step after cementing our deal with CBS was in fact to compose and prepare for the first sessions, to work with our scriptwriter and our lyricists to put together the content, the score, so that I could walk into the studio with everything written down, ready to be played and interpreted by the, the musicians. I divided the sessions into initially band sessions, and those band members were almost entirely musicians that I'd worked with many times before. They were, during that period of time, the governors, the, 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 the guys that just set a standard for not only musical interpretation, sight reading, which they could come into any session and read just about everything. The lyrics for The War of the Worlds were uh, very interesting because they were an outgrowth almost entirely from the book and therefore the, uh, the subject matter for writing lyrics uh, came from, from H.G. Wells' words. Once we had the ideas for songs, which were performed by characters within the story, uh, I turned to Gary Osborne, Paul Vigrass, who were already a, a singing duo and had written many lyrics together. The one song that was not written for The War of the Worlds, ironically, is a song called Forever Autumn. And that was authored in terms of lyrics by Gary and Paul Vigrass. And then the remaining lyric that probably came just by the fact when I was composing The Eve of the War, there was this sort of uh, little section in the first chapter that I adapted and created the lyric for that. Uh, the chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one, he said. Uh, that's what my lyric became from his, uh, from H.G.'s original text. Writing the script for The War of the Worlds grew from the multitude of times I read and reread the novel. And in fact, I still have to this day the actual copy where you can see all my scribbles, all the underlining that I did of given passages that led to giving me as the composer ideas to when I started composing the score, as well as to Doreen Wayne's script. And we bounced back and forth between ourselves, with my dad acting as executive producer, with Gary, Paul, myself from the lyrical point of view, and it just evolved together. Doreen's role, though, was like the glue to the whole piece, and that she had to know timings to the point where, like scoring a, a movie, where it's to the precise fraction of a second. She had to know exactly where I was going to uh, have a piece of music, be it thematic or a sung moment, and then hand it over to our journalists or other actors. And she had to adapt to precise timings as well as make it creatively correct. When I compose, uh, I generally work at a, a keyboard, a piano or an electronic instrument. As do, say, songwriters might work if they're guitarists, they'll work at their instrument, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but when I come to arranging or orchestration, uh, until I get to sort of correcting notes to see if I've written any notes wrong, everything comes away from an instrument and I'll just sit at, I can just sit at any table and just orchestrate away, no matter what the style of the music is. That's my style. I guess I'm from the era where traditional arranging and orchestration has been taught to me. And I've also found it much freer from a creative point of view that if you hear something, you can actually put it into score form uh, much freer uh, away from an instrument. Whereas if, say me as a keyboardist, if I start doing my orchestrations at the piano or at a keyboard, it'll start sounding like a keyboard arrangement. Writing um, pieces that were that long, created for the music copyist, uh, my old mate David White, uh, to create so many pages that represented what the piece to be played was by the band, uh, created an unexpected sort of dilemma in that once he's copied all the parts out and you open up 12 minutes worth of music paper, it was almost like a mini book. And I do have this very vivid memory of, of two sort of setups. And regardless of whether I was playing and conducting from a keyboard, which a lot of the tracks I did, or a couple that needed conducting from a podium, all I recall in the sense of, for example, Barry Morgan as our drummer, he was put into an isolation booth with the door closed so that 
his drumming didn't spill onto other musicians' tracks, and all you would have is a window for him to see you from the conducting point of view and vice versa. And all I recall with Barry is his head tipping up over these music uh, pages, but they were totally surrounding him. So as he would play, you'd see this head sort of turning like this in a circle and back again if there were any repeats. And, the, and in a different way, uh, Herbie Flowers and Joe Partridge, who sat next to each other, Herbie on bass, Joe on acoustic rhythm guitar, had this long row of music stands uh, reading off of the same part rather than them each having their own separate parts because they were just so long. I remember visiting Horsell Common in Woking in the county of Surrey soon after I started composing my score around March 1976. This was the place the first cylinder landed containing the initial batch of Martians along with their amazing fighting and handling machines and incredible weapons of death including the laser-like heat ray, or the black dust that could smother entire areas of population, or the beautiful but deadly vegetation, the red weed. How clever these Martians were, I thought. There was no sat-nav or traffic control bringing them in for a perfect landing, but land perfectly they did, right on Horsell Common's most open field, with their cylinder pointing right side up. But of course, I realized these were incredibly smart dudes, who had the ability to plan precisely, not only where they wanted to land, but a place they could safely leave their cylinder and set up camp to build their machines and begin the process of taking over the earth. And if anyone was to get in their way, well, pow with their heat rays, game over. Horsell Common today remains very much undisturbed common land where people daily walk their dogs or couples might come for a snog. I didn't see any of that then, nor now, all I could see was this alien invasion unfolded with no prospect but a horrible death for humanity. Horsell Common and Heat Ray, well that's, that's got the, the scary start, that's the start, that's the bit of the album where you begin to get a little bit scared, possibly you know that something's going to be happening. And in Horsell Common you, you get to meet the Martians for the first time, you get to hear their sound and you get to um, hear the Heat Ray. It makes its first major statement, rather than being part of the composition of the Eve of the War, the Heat Ray melody that, that is played uh, is one of several melodies, in fact, of the total composition called Horsell Common and the Heat Ray. Uh, so you get this um, evolution of melodies, arrangements, and sounds, and each time our journalist is sort of setting us up and saying, right, here is sort of the, the Martian coming out of the cylinder, and you hear this melody. <laughs> And then it, it carries on, but the, the lead of the instruments playing it uh, is played by George Fenton, who uh, played a tar and a santer. Okay, well this is uh, a tar, and I played this melody again on uh, the piano earlier today. We just heard about these Martians coming out of the cylinder. Right. Uh, and for want of a better sub-theme name, I just call it the Fat Man theme. Oh, uh, okay. In my, in my head, I always depicted these Martians as just brains, sort of lumbering. Right, right, right. Like that, and the melody hopefully reflects that. Yeah. Second time round, the track grows a bit, and it's the Sanctor which again, both that and the tar were played by George Fenton, right. obviously not at the same time, no. tracked up an octave from the tar. So the track is opened up, the Martians are lumbering some more, but more and more of them are coming out of these cylinders. And then at the end of this, our journalist tells us what follows is the formal entrance of the heat ray. The heat ray was a, uh, a performance that Joe created by the way he tuned his guitar. And, and 
it was, I believe, all the strings tuned to the same note, and the sound was very sort of fuzzy and huge because all the, 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 the strings were uh, essentially playing the same note. And then all the melodies had been composed that the heat ray plays on, and it depends where you are in the story that you hear the heat ray sound. And I think you've got two more. I think it's quite a bit. Keep it going all the way down. That's it. And how about the, uh, the rhythm? Waka chicka, waka chicka, waka chicka. Okay, that chap's hiding around here. Okay. This chap here. Now, that is a sign of the times. This sort of guitar. Sure. Sorry. The wild rhythm guitar. In context to the heat ray, it's just that chugging feel that keeps moving on. And throughout the whole piece, which it, it comes and goes, but it's a, a sort of a bass riff mm. that is the underlying uh, sort of groove, if you want to call it that, which starts off. continuous sort of chord pattern that again comes and goes. And this carries on underneath other tunes that come and go and it comes back at the end and you, you get this continual pulse that feels like there's always this intrepidation of, of, of evil, of menace that's uh, coming our way as, as humans and uh, it passes all the way through Horsel Common and the Heat Ray. So I cleanse the area. It's the, it's the phrase I, I played earlier on the piano. All right, OK. But now you can hear it for what it was meant to be. And uh, although the notes were written out, and Herbie played it as written, as he would, he would come up with ideas about, hey, why don't I play the same thing again up an octave? And when he does, and when it comes in, you can suddenly hear the quality changes because it, you get a little more click, you get a little more top right. end. It adds and embellishes the whole feel of that riff. So so what's what's going on here? How's he getting this this low sound? Because that's, that's lower than a, a normal bass, isn't it? Uh, he may have tuned the, his lowest string did, down. Did you use a harmonizer? Yes, but in addition to that, okay. our original engineer, Jeff Young, had his own ideas. And like yourself, you know you don't leave things just to, to sound the way they sound. When appropriate, you'll add your own magic right. into something that gives added personality. Yeah. Jeff did the same with that. He heard this riff and picked up on the idea that to give it a little more of an alien quality, he ran it through the harmonizer. So it has this eerier quality than yeah. a straight bass. Scary you know, moment. Well, yeah. uh, the sound effect for the unscrewing of the cylinder always seems to uh, surprise people that it was nothing more than a very simple approach. Uh, albeit that it took a few different attempts to get the end result. Next morning, and the there am I on acoustic saucepan, hypnotized by the unstable. turning it ever so slowly. <laughs> Two feet of and Jeff Young magnified it up so by the time we got to mix it, we had something that had this huge off. presence, and that was a separate effect that my wife Geraldine helped with. Uh, that's the lid falling that off. That is isn't the it? lid falling that's off. That's right. Tripping over the <laughs> <laughs> Geraldine was in charge of all the sound effects. Her, her uh, credit is subtly listed as Pest on the double album, the original one. And uh, in those days, sound effects libraries were the traditional place you'd go uh, to find sound effects. Some of them were from these libraries. Others were commercial recordings that you could purchase. The BBC had a fantastic library. Today everything is purchasable on CDs and in my studio I've got 
uh, 20, 30 CDs of every sort of sound effect that you can imagine, and the whole approach today would be different. But in those days, that was how you tended to do it. And Geraldine went out knowing from the script, from my score, what we were looking for, and most of them made their way in to the recording. There's a few that we're actually bringing back to life from the uh, on the 5.1 surround sound mix that uh, just uh, gives another element that I actually wish I'd included first time round. Now we hear this is Ken on synthesizers again, and the melody that I had, the demos that we did live, which have still survived, I scored them uh, for vibraphone and xylophone. So you hear this cl clanging sort of, which is notation of the exact notes, and with those uh, sort of live instruments, the, 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 the sort of the vibes and um, uh, the xylophones, you just put sort of markings that tell the player to do them as a, like a trill. After the band left, we start building up the electronic sounds to the same phrases. Ken had an idea of what I wanted, and he translated into the, into the area of electronics that we want. So, If I was recording The War of the Worlds today, I think there would be a substantial difference. My mindset in the 70s was live performance and analog technology, which by comparison with today is prehistoric. The War of the Worlds was recorded in three different studios. The first one and the main studio was AdVision Studios London, which is no longer there, but it was a, a top studio that major artists long before me and after me uh, worked there in different forms. The symphonic string section that I did all my scores for was recorded at uh, EMI Abbey Road Studio One, which is a famous uh, studio throughout the, the recording world. Its size and the sound of it was absolutely distinct and uh, it, was only, it was only one place I really wanted to record, record my string sections. And then Richard Burton's one of two days that he worked with us was done in California at uh, was a very famous studio, Wally Hyder's. When I started recording The War of the Worlds, the technology of the day was 24-track tape. It just happened that AdVision Studios, where I started the, and did the, virtually all the recordings uh, and mixing of The War of the Worlds, uh, had a distribution company for equipment hire. Uh, and they had just taken delivery of what became known as the MagLink. And that was a bit of technology that linked more than one machine together. And so suddenly the opportunity to link two 24-track machines and therefore making it a 48-track production uh, came to be offered to me by the studio on the, the sole basis that I was gonna be the guinea pig. They had just taken delivery of this MagLink and nobody knew if it was gonna work well sort of well or not at all. And during the course of the production, it was a bit of all of that. There were days that it just worked like a dream and others when you'd sit there for hours while maintenance came up and tried to sort it out. Well, they weren't as precise in those days as they are today. And also because of that muggling code, which was really a, a prototype kind of syncing system at the time, it was the first that was used to actually sync up two to 24 track machines in the 70s. Um, that system was only doing its best to keep the machines in constant speed, but in order to keep them in constant speed, you had to constantly move up and down the slave machine to keep it basically in time with the master machine. And that wasn't a really exact science in those days. And that's why there was a quite a lot of fluctuation. It was an imperfect bit of technology that did allow something that could never have been done before to happen, but you paid a price for it. We passed our waiting hours for Mr. Maglink, so to speak, to uh, get itself working again uh, in, a, in a few bizarre ways. And it always seemed to come from uh, tests of our own fortitude and that we would bet against each other, like for five pounds, who would take a, like an Indian curry, a fall, which is as pretty hot as you can get, and mix that in a, in a glass with uh, a pencil that we had chopped up, including with the, the lead, and add to that cigarette butts and I mean the most bizarre ingredients and whoever would actually drink it would win the fiver. All for a fiver? I ask. <laughs> Approval from Ollie, my old English sheepdog, who was with me for years previous to the War of the Worlds and in fact I used to take him on tour with me when I um, toured with David Essex and right through the writing stage where he would accompany me to the places that 
the story took place in, Primrose Hill, uh, right up through all the recording sessions. And uh, Oliver had this habit, unfortunately, of farting, but it was actually uh, uh, very useful because he seemed to be selective when he'd let one fly, which was always when the band came in for to listen to a, a take, and I would never have to turn to the band and say, that was pretty bad, guys, because Oliver would have already farted his disapproval. The string orchestra, which was a, a sort of a symphonic size string section, was about halfway through the production. There's no sort of logical or exact time that you would record strings. It was just the right time. I'd gotten to the point with the band where I knew now where I wanted my string orchestrations to go. Uh, I went away for a couple of weeks to Cornwall to a, and rented a, a small house that had no phone in it just so I could isolate myself, do the work, came back, booked the string orchestra, and off we went. Conducting has always been one of my favorite elements of any style of music. And when you work with a, a big orchestra, or in this case, a string orchestra of about 52 string players, it's, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, you're in the music. It's not quite the same as when you work with a band because a band is partially electric and you don't necessarily hear other than through the headphones, everything that's going on. And that's all going on at the same time, isn't it? Yeah. String machine there? No, that's real strings. That's real strings. Sacra bleu. <laughs> 52 bloody string players, and you call it a string machine. <laughs> the length of the production, in other words, before mixing and editing started, uh, the first band sessions were May 18, 1976, and we started mixing somewhere between May and June. I think it was about May of 1977 and it was handed in on July 1st, which happens to be my birthday, 1977, to the then uh, chairman of the group. And I was so insecure about whether this was any good that my wife, Geraldine, took it in and handed it to him personally. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of passion by everybody finding the right parts for them, starting with my scores and, and the compositions, uh, but just a, a great time, long, uh, both in duration of the overall production and many sessions that were 12, 14, even 16 hour sessions. But everybody's spirit was just amazing and that's what I probably remember most. This is uh, another gem from the Herbie Flowers camp. Yes, this is an opening gem from here. It was to create a, a score, a composition, that reflected the storyline, which was at the opening we join the artilleryman who has made his way to the journalist's house and the two of them meet up for the first time and for different reasons they are wanting to head toward London. The artilleryman to rejoin his division within the army that have been partially decimated earlier on at Horsel Common and the journalist realizes of the now pending dangers and his fiance and her father live in London so they both set out on foot together to go their particular ways uh, for their own reasons. And it's the encounters they experience, including seeing for the first time and hearing the fighting machines and the ulas. And the music is to represent their travels along the way. Well, the ula, the expression of the Martians, actually was not originally going to be a guitar part. It was going to be uh, a synthesized part. And I did ask Prof, Ken Freeman, to see if he could devise a synthesizer that could create the, the vowels, ooh-la, set to um, probably a keyboard performance of the notes and the harmonies that the ooh-la was scored in and created to be. And it came out sounding like ooh-ah. You couldn't get the, the L's, the ooh-la. It just failed. It was at about that point as we got going with the band sessions that I had a chat with Joe because he was, uh, a guitarist who used to work with a voice box, which was a tube that you'd insert into your mouth and you would create sounds, expressions. Peter Frampton actually was the guitarist that set that sort of popularity in motion and other guitarists followed and Joe was one of them. The notes were actually played off of the guitar, but the sort of performance came through what he did with the mouth into this tube.
Another area I would walk around in those early days was the Marylebone Road, Piccadilly Circus, and Oxford and Regent Streets, areas today that are great for shopping, eating, and sightseeing. It's easy to forget that in H.G. Wells' 19th century England, there were no mobile phones, email, or modern transportation, so word would have initially spread very slowly of the impending alien onslaught. But as word got round, these same streets suddenly turned humanity into a herd of cattle fleeing desperately out of London to escape to the seafront and hopefully a boat leaving England away from the ever-pursuing Martians. Flight and pursuit, conquest and the conquered, these are realities of the modern world that resonate today within so many countries and peoples on our planet. It's not hard to put such realities more seriously into context, rather than through the telling of a story of a 19th century invasion by those from some unproven world. But H.G. was a very clever bloke. The Martians and their invasion weren't just some story of fantasy to pass the reader's idle time, but an analogy for evil and shameless power far from the fantasy world of invading Martians and science fiction, but directly into our moral consciousness. With Forever Autumn, we have a storyline that has been almost all to do with pending doom, death and destruction at Horsell Common, and even worse, as the journalist and the artillerymen are heading their own ways toward London. And we've arrived at a moment when the journalist has arrived at his fiancée's home, her name being Carrie, and her, and her father, and he discovers they're not there. The shock to his system must have been great. Oh, just fantastic lyrics, I think, is um, one way of wrapping up a description on that song. Uh, brilliant lyrics, brilliantly sung. Um, perfect love song for the album. Uh, needed a love song in the story. In his mind, she's not there, because you're not here, you're not there, where are you? And the song that I felt it demanded was a song that would completely changed the moment that we had previously been left with. Powerful performances, driving rhythms, oolahs all over the place, and I wanted to tone it down for the first time in the recording. And I tried to compose one of several different tunes and expect Gary, Gary and Paul to come up with a lyric that would fit the moment of the script. And I kept coming back to a song called Forever Autumn. And the song was recorded originally in 1972 on the debut album of Vigrass and Osborne, but its previous life to that was the equivalent of one verse of a melody that Gary and Paul sang doo-doo-doos on for a Lego Toys commercial. And it became a song because the public at the time started right into the advertising agency saying, oh, that's a lovely tune. Is it a record or where does it come from? And uh, Gary, Paul, and myself, we decided to extend it into a song. So I finished off the, the, the composition. Gary and Paul wrote this lovely lyric, and we recorded it as part of their debut album, and it was a big hit in Japan. Several years later, I'm writing The War of the Worlds, and I've come to this moment that I can't figure out anything better than Forever Autumn. I, I realized it needed sort of tweaking to place it in the score from an orchestration point of view. Uh, Paul and Gary had to tighten up the lyrics in relation to the script, but there was nothing that I could come up with that I felt was better than Forever Autumn, and hence it came into the War of the Worlds. It's the only thing not originally created for the War of the Worlds, and ironically it became a, a big hit. Justin does a set on his own, I believe, uh, on either all or a very large part of his uh, touring with the Moody Blues, and he does do Forever Autumn, I believe, as a pure acoustic piece, and it's always well received, and on their compilation albums and the best ofs, it's always appearing there, and uh, it's a, a compliment, I think, to Justin's performance and the good fortune of, of getting him to work on, on the project with me. I watch the birds fly south across the autumn sky 
silent, grey, ironclad, thunder child. Slowly it moved toward shore, then with a deafening roar and whoosh of spray, it swung about and drove at full speed towards the waiting Martians. Another of the places I originally visited when researching the War of the Worlds was the Essex coast of England. H.G. had described not only the area itself perfectly, but all the roads from around the country that led directly to the seafront. And it was here on this coastline that the climactic battle between the warship, known as the Thunderchild, and the waiting Martians in their fighting machines, ready to fire their heat rays and release their blanket of deadly black dust, would take place. This epic encounter became the defining moment of the first half of both the novel and my musical version. It was depicted in song describing man's last hope for victory before there would be no hope left at all. Gary Osborne's powerful lyrics depict this battle perfectly, and our listeners hear how the Thunderchild's valiant heart gave all that it could give before breaking, then sinking beneath the waters to the all-powerful Martians. Mankind had already lost on land and would now be defeated in the water. Our album cover freezes in time that moment when we learn the Earth belonged to the Martians. Thunderchild is the culmination, both in the H.G. Wells story and our parallel interpretation in, in the musical version, to uh, conclude the first half. H.G. Wells divided his book into two halves. One is the first half, the coming of the Martians. The second half is the earth under the Martians. And Thunderchild completes the picture of the first half. It depicts what we see on the album cover between uh, the battle between Thunderchild the boat and the Martians in their fighting machines. It is the climactic moment and the song Thunderchild really tells us all about that. The, the lyrics are powerful and they have an expression of the peril of humanity at that moment and at the very end it's topped off by a giant oola which represents sorry humans you've lost and uh, it's us the Martians who have won and that's the end of the first half. and sizes scattered out along the bay and I thought I heard her calling as the steamer pulled away the invaders must have seen them as across the coast they piled standing from between them there lay thunder Thunder Child um, is a piece of music that Jeff's fooled around with the time signature and it's written in 7-4 and the reason he's chosen this is he can create a rolling feel which gives you the impression that you're out in the ocean and the waves are really big because the, the beat doesn't fall exactly where it would fall in a 4-4 time signature. Uh, it gives you this wonderful feeling of a rolling motion. The painting of the Thunder Child was one of a number of paintings we commissioned. Each one was to grab a major moment within given sequences throughout the whole recording. But the Thunderchild probably depicts mostly 
the climax of that first half. So it doesn't reveal what's going on after, but it's not at the very start. And most importantly, it's the major moment between man and machine, human and Martian, without revealing what the end result is. So it's the climactic battle of the first half. It reflects humanity against alien, and ultimately it was the one that was chosen to represent the, uh, the War of the Worlds. And slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. When we knew that of the type of voice and the type of project that the War of the Worlds had grown to, it was a British work. H.G. Wells was the uh, sort of definitive English author of his time. And I wanted everything about the project to be British. It's British characters set in Victorian England. Uh, and therefore, the list that we created for the role of the journalist, it wasn't all that long but Richard was at the top of it. His, vo his voice was so magnetic. And I even chucked out a piece of music that I had written for his opening words because in this case, less was more. And his voice just set the tone for the entire piece. Finding Richard Burton turned out to be one of the easiest uh, results of anything to do with the War of the Worlds. And probably dumb luck played the largest part. We discovered that he was appearing in a Broadway play called Equus. Therefore, he was at this theater in New York eight times a week doing his show. And so I sent him a letter introducing myself and saying what I and our team were uh, attempting to do with this H.G. Wells novel. What I didn't know until the, f the first day of recording Richard in California was that, uh, and it must have been on a tea break or something like that, he said, you know, you, you probably don't know this. He said, but I'm an avid reader. And during the run of Equus, I asked my wife, who at that point was Susie Hunt, uh, or Susie Burton, uh, to go out and buy me some books. And one of them turned out to be The War of the Worlds. And your letter and your script arrived within a day or two of him finishing the actual work. He said, so it was as if it was meant to be, separate from the fact I loved the project and loved the book when I had read it. But it was just that amazing coincidence that here he had just read the book and a day or two later, my letter arrived. He did have a bit of a, a hellraiser uh, reputation attached to him and uh, I expected somebody to walk through the door and just mangle up the whole session. What arrived was quite the opposite. He was a man that had amazing charisma. The second he walked into the room, you knew he was in it. He was the absolute total professional who Within our contract, we had up to five days to record him, and he completed the entire work within one day, other than a few hours, maybe half a day, months later back in London, which was because of repair work. A few months after the album was out, he went home to Wales to visit his family and friends. The album had become quite a big hit, and he suddenly discovered that particularly young boys and girls were running up to him with the covers of the album, black vinyl disc in those days, asking for his autograph. And he said, oh, I remember doing this project. And suddenly he was like a pop star, which seemed to please him, you know, equally at least as all the great work he'd done as a straight actor. Uh, and uh, he arrived back in London and called me up and said, dear boy, come over for a cup of tea and uh, we'll talk. And I said, Richard, you know, there's some gold and platinum albums that I know CBS have got waiting for you would you agree to me coming over with a photographer and uh, posing, holding your well-earned uh, platinum and gold disc? He said, oh, I'd love to. And I did just that. And so although we had a lovely informal cup of tea and, and catching up with each other, I did grab the opportunity of bringing the photographer and some great photos remain to this day. Working with him turned out to be quite the opposite of what my expectations were. We were working on a, a television special where he had been asked to read the works of Dylan Thomas, who was a personal friend of his. And he had asked me to compose the score for this TV special. And I was all keen and gung-ho, and I was uh, reading some of the scripts and the, uh, and the various works of Dylan Thomas of the stuff that Richard wanted to record. And we spent a day together reviewing that. And sadly, he passed away two weeks later. Walking around the main villages and towns in England with cottages and buildings having thatched roofs always reminded me of a time of beautiful innocence, the personification of pastoral England. While the architecture dates back long before the Martian invasion of the 1890s, these humble dwellings survive to this day. 
Constructed of tightly woven straw, they are very good at keeping out rain, snow, and hail. Unfortunately, thatch could also be an attractive abode for such uninvited guests as small rodents, insects, and birds. Other uninvited guests, such as aliens from another world, I'm sure, were never contemplated in 19th century England, even if the visitors brought seeds of their red weed to plant, suggesting an offering of a harvest of various fruits and vegetables. The seeds of the red weed, planted in our earth soon after the marauders landed, took time to spring to life. But when the first branches appeared from beneath our soil, beautiful in appearance as they were, unfortunately for humanity, were not gifts of life at all. Quite the opposite, the red weed was a vegetation of death. Its tentacle-like branches grew slowly, spreading across our land mostly unnoticed, until the earth was almost like a blanket of blood able to choke and smother all that it embraced. While the Martians could kill instantly with their heat rays, the red weed was a death in slow motion. Okay, so here we are at the red weed. Indeed. And uh, maybe you'd like to talk us through a little bit of this. Okay, well, the, we're now in the second half of the story, and the Earth has been taken over by the Martians. Their weapons of death, like the heat ray, have decimated large chunks of Next day, a, a dawn Great was Britain, a fiery red, and our journalist and is telling us the end result lurid of that. Of another planet. Well, the vegetation which gives Mars Composing the Red Weed, I was trying to capture what I think H.G. Wells was trying to depict in words, and that the Red Weed was, it was a vegetation of death, so make no mistake that its intentions was to, to kill. But it was a vegetation that also had beauty about it. So it had this sort of dichotomy between beauty and death. To me, almost like the eve of the war, it needed something added to it to add this tension or this in this case for the red weed a combination of a pretty melody set against uh, an alien and death-like mood so i went from this melody with traditional chords and i my accompaniment was written in a, an entirely different key and the effect of that is that there was only one note between the two keys that actually were common to these two keys everything else there was this dissonance, and it adds a mood that uh, I think succeeded. Uh, and so here we have, and then we have this going on underneath it, which is, this is in the key of G, and this is in the key of B. And when you combine them, you get, come back to the two keys. This one really required full scoring to get the, the, this effect of two separate keys. I mean, when I played it on the piano, obviously I knew the combination sure. of, of the two chords and the two keys, uh, but that was all broken down by instrument to give what became the end result of the composition. Like a slimy red so as yes, we've got that evil sound back again. Yeah, that very high melody, I think from from my memory, can play pretty much that same sound throughout. Oh, the red weed, uh, that's probably the most complicated piece of music uh, to record that's on the album. And the reason that is, it's got no time signature or rhythm structure to it. It's a free form, it's jazz, and so um, knowing when you've got the master, the, the, the final take, is, was probably very difficult for Jeff. Yeah, the, in my score you would have seen sort of three or four markings that would describe drones, atmospheres, eeriness, and, and sort of an area of range for the sounds to appear. And then Prof just would have taken over and started coming up with ideas and I'd say, yeah, that's great. And then another one maybe in a 
di different octave, different interpretation, until the total became what you hear. And then the next bit within the story is it says it starts to grow and move again. You get this section. And then we return to etc. And then it it moves on and other things unfold within the story. You're really relying upon all the musicians, all the chemistry of the musicians really coming together and, and influencing each other at that point. The complexity of the Red Weed probably emanates from the fact it was written in two keys and I heard these sort of sounds that, uh, that Prof came up with eventually that were eerie, sort of like a sine wave. And I think from an engineering point of view, there was a limit to how much any human could tolerate if, over the days that we kept recording it. And Jeff, our engineer, Jeff Young, absolutely found it at a point almost intolerable to record. And I would see him suddenly just getting up and leaving the room and needing a break and coming back in. This section here, which I didn't play on the piano, represents the, the, the weed at its biggest flowering, I guess. It's, it's really just opened up now. It's, it's at, at its most beautiful and at its most deadly. And then it comes back down at the end, as it's starting to hear. And it's a, it's a, a counterpoint between the, the lead guitar and this symphonic scoring going against it. So human, alien, it was all trying to mix these feelings together. Now we come back to the slower elements of the Red Wee. How many of us would stand up and be counted for what we truly believed in, or for those we loved, even laying down our lives for a principle so others could live? Every day we read and see in the news of invaders from one nation into another, fighting for or against democracy, or in the name of one's God. It's not a new theme either. History has repeated itself time and time again. But if those in high political or religious positions cannot solve the world's problems, who then do we believe in? Who do we follow? In the War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells offered us a curate, or as he turned out in my musical version, a parson named Nathaniel, a man of the cloth, someone who people should have been able to rely on for physical and spiritual support. As it turned out, even Parson Nathaniel was just as human as the rest of us. In fact, he failed his flock big time long before others gave up their souls to the Martians. Nathaniel, in fact, was unable to distinguish between an alien force that came to destroy all of humanity, regardless of race, faith, or place of birth, and the devil himself. Only his wife, Beth, knew the essence of life. There must be something worth living for, something worth dying for. And if one man can stand tall, there must be hope for us all, somewhere, somewhere in the spirit of man. Amen, brother. Listen, do you hear them drawing near in their search for the sinners? The Spirit of Man, when we get to this track, I think this is um, a, mo a moment of genius for Chris Spedding, one of the guitarists on the album. If you listen to his solo, it's possibly got to be one of, one of his finest. It's a wonderful piece of work. There is a curse on mankind and of course, and it, and it accompanies Phil in its vocals, which are brilliant. They kind of got the hairs on my arms standing up on end. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we just kind of go a little bit before, this is Phil Linnett, who's playing this the part Phil. of... Parson Nathaniel, right. and he's, he's believing the Martians are the devil, not recognize them as right. Martians. There's a lot of clever guitar work, again, by Chris in here. Uh, one part would have been played with the band, but then it's a build-up of other parts which cannot be played all at the same time. Right, right, right. But a little later when we get to the solo, that's the one you meant. Yeah. And this is Julie. Julie. There was this role of Beth, the parson's wife, that became a duet. Uh, of good over evil, of uh, 
a voice that had to represent sanity because the parson was going totally bonkers. Uh, and here's a man of the cloth who uh, couldn't see the distinction between Martians and the devil. He thought they were one and the same. Beth, his wife, was this calm or this attempted calm to lead him back into the, to the sane world. And I knew Julie's voice had this purity about her and distinctive quality as she proved you know, during the same period of time by playing Evita on uh, Evita, singing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. This is a section of multi-guitars. Yes, this is brilliant too. All, all Chris again. Yes, it's, you know, a solo that's constructed out of three, four, four different guitar parts. End moment there. <laughs> yep. But not the window breaking. Now that was, a that was your wife that again? That's Geraldine poking her little <laughs> nose into everything. That was the television out the window, I think, on that, that occasion. <laughs> Dear God. There's a mixture of a real sound effect and, and Ken's. But we've gone from this very simple sort of moment of, of Beth sort of singing No Nathaniel, and then suddenly. We're back to you know, a bit of death and destruction. Another cylinder has landed on the house that they live in. Beth has been killed. Tragic. We'll even build a railway and tunnel to the coast. Go there for our holidays. Nothing can stop men like us. I've made a start already. Come on down here, have a look. How could a common artilleryman envision a world of survival when Parson Nathaniel, an educated and ordained man, failed us all so miserably at life's first hurdle? But in fact, it was this young soldier who did have a plan to take the best of those who survived the initial onslaught by the Martians and rebuild a new and perfect world. What a great idea. Choose the elite from all walks of life and start all over again. Hold on a second, who chooses who's best? Will it be the artillery man? Or how about Adolf man? Or Stalin man? Not a pleasant thought suddenly, because we'd all like to think each of us are the best, deserving of being part of a brave new world. Extermination by a Martian is one thing, but by a fellow man? I don't think so, do you? The other little detail about the artillery man's vision wasn't about survival on top of the earth, having a drink at one's local pub with your friendly Martian. Not at all. This was a new world to be built underground. Civilization starting again from scratch. Noah's Ark, but without Noah, the Ark and water. And the only problem with the artilleryman was that in spite of his incredible vision, minus the selecting process, of course, was that he was a dreamer, like most of us. Do as I say, not as I do, which in the case of the artilleryman, wasn't very much. Instead of a brave new world, perfectly in balance with itself, the total output of our visionary was in fact a rather pathetic indent into the earth, which tired the dear boy out, requiring him to rest, then play games and drink champagne. The Martians had truly nothing to fear from the artilleryman and his brave new world. <laughs> Listen. At the world we've come to know. It's a really brave Doesn't vocal, isn't it? It's got a lot of dynamics in it. Throughout. It goes through ups and downs, ins and outs. Brave New World, which is the, the main piece, the song that David performs, is carrying on from where the journalist has left where the red weed has uh, taken over. The journalist is on the road again and he's heading toward London yet again. And he suddenly comes across an artilleryman who just says, halt, who goes there? And he focuses in, in the story, 
I said, my goodness, it's the artilleryman. It's built around these major and minor chords uh, and uh, designed for a big symphonic string section and uh, other instruments. But on the piano, it's... And by that point, the artilleryman has set the tone with what he sees. Then he starts to sing, and he sings about his brave new world. start all over again. But David is setting the tone as the artillery man about this this new world that we can all survive you know, underground. And uh, his performance is electric in my opinion. And, uh, he just captures you and, and you're caught up in being taken into his, his new world, his new plan of survival. Quintessential pop English singer is about the best way I think of describing David here. And I think that was, that was the love of this track, that it needed um, that quintessential English pop singer. And, and David was around and, and fits the bill perfectly, really. At the world we've come to know Does it seem to be much more The role that David played as the artilleryman uh, was to me, a culmination of the years that we had worked together to get to the point where we were recording uh, his role on the War of the Worlds, but also because of his very distinctive style, just not as a, a singer alone, but also his acting ability. He was uh, the perfect artillery man, and although we were mates and we worked professionally together on his career, uh, he still had to be convinced that this role was right for him on the War of the Worlds. And I was, you know, so pleased that he. Uh, participated and he gave so much of his personality into the role of the artilleryman and I think part of it is uh, the, the the end result really is partly why it sounds as individual as it does. Um, uh, another bit of genius that's going on in that track is Ken Freeman's work. Um, he, he's managed to construct drum sounds from one of his many synthesizers which he had at the time and I think it's a, a masterful piece of work. So you hear, you got a big brass score, <coughs> which Ken played, instead of it being live brass, it was synthesized. And then this little piccolo, which I figured, because it's the marching type of sound, you know, so the big brass against it. He's over in the corner there. And those snares, or what people think are snares, all can on the synthesizer. So instead what? of deliberately bringing in, from a drumming point of view, a drummer that could play that, the synthesized quality gives it just its own extra personality. Can I say that? Yes, we certainly can, because I, I, I think this is a bit of uh, genius work from, from uh, the professor here, and we'll just go back a couple of bars. And uh, so this element here, he's constructed by him on a synthesizer. And although you might think isolated like that, it doesn't sound that exciting. Well, we can add the second element to it, which is the, the sort of the bass drum area. And then we, if also we put, can. right, and we put that all in the track and uh, well, to me, it sounds like a military band. It really does, yeah. I think it's a, a fantastic piece of work. Etc. So the song unfolds, and by the time we get to the end of it, we've learned that uh, the artilleryman is more a dreamer than a realist because he invites the journalist back, having done this whole long piece about how it's all going to happen. Uh, he goes back 
to his house and shows the journalist, here's what I've done so far. And the journalist takes a look down. It's a tiny little hole. It's a nothing. It's not a brave new world. It's not even brave. It's just a little, a little pitch of sand or, or dirt that's sort of unfolded. Uh, and in between uh, the odd shovel of, of dirt, uh, the artillery man suggests, uh, well, let's play some cards. Let's, uh, let's drink champagne. And the journalist is saying, what's going on here? The whole world is, is being decimated by these Martians and he wants to play games. He wants to drink champagne. At that point, you realize it's time to move on and the journalist leaves the artillery man. The journalist, having left the artillery man and his brave new world, was on the road toward London once again, not knowing what fate would be facing him. The Martians, he presumed, were continuing their rampage over Earth, guarding their new planet with the might of their machines and weapons. And like the journalist, I too had returned to London, my journey almost complete, having visited so many places that had originally inspired me to create a musical version of the War of the Worlds. I concluded that H.G. hadn't written some simple tale of an alien invasion, of the shoot 'em up knock 'em down kind. Nope. He had written strong themes about the survival of mankind, of evil power unleashed, our moral consciousness challenged, not by Martians, but in fact by our own fellow brothers of planet Earth. Perhaps that's why the War of the World survives today, long after so many other stories of science fiction have long departed, just like the Martians. And so, here I was again, back at Primrose Hill, still freezing cold, wet, and well pissed off that we hadn't enjoyed better weather while on location. But then I thought of the journalist. He arrived in London at the end of his story, prepared to give his life to the Martians, because he had lost all hope of survival and those he had loved. But what greeted him wasn't death at all, but the sound of a haunting cry echoing through the streets of a dead city, dead London. And suddenly the wailing stopped. How could this be? And unlike me, who wanted to get off Primrose Hill and warm my soul with a hot cup of tea, the journalist had arrived at its foot and with newfound energy assaulted its peak. And what did he find but the Martians, dead inside their machines, with birds feasting on the flesh of these alien creatures, with the machines as lifeless as their masters. Just a very haunting track, I think, really. That's that's how, how it goes for me. This would be Ken's work again, wouldn't it? All yep. these, all the wind effects here. Wind, and I used to call some of these higher sounds like bacteria and things like right, that. Right, okay. And that instrument? Trumpet synth. Guitar, open guitar, long, long with the more like harmonics on the guitar. The Mood for Dead London is, a, is an extension of where our story has just left off. The journalist has left the artilleryman dreaming about his brave new world. It's an up-tempo, very positive song. But the journalist has moved on and he arrives in London, the streets of London, not knowing what he's going to find. What he does find is a city that's dead of, of humanity, but he also he hears for the first time the familiar Ulas, but not triumphant. They are haunting and they are dying. There were a dozen dead bodies in the Euston Road, their outlines softened by the black dust. So this is you on Jangle still. piano, yes? I'm on Jangle, and no matter what is going on throughout the whole piece, stove. that Jangle just drones away, to wine trying to be just hypnotic and, and deliberately repetitive. Some gold chains and a watch were scattered on the pavement. Yeah, phase, yeah, no, phase, 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 phase yeah. that would have been a, that would have been a new effect in 1978. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even earlier, 76, yeah. 76, somewhere in there. Then we hear the dying Martians, which are uh, sort of performed by Joe Partridge doing a, a, a new type of oola, one that is dying. 
The culmination of dead London is that he arrives at Primrose Hill to see below him all the machines absolutely dormant, still, and the Martians around them or inside the machines are dead. Log part one. That's that's the um, that the happy part of the album. That's where everybody realizes the Martians have died. That it's you know it's all over. They're not going to come again. We've been invaded. Um, it's all finished, and we've got a bright new future to look forward to. We've been left with the sudden change of something that's passed, and that's the passing of the Martians. We don't yet know why, or the journalist doesn't. Although we learn in the epilogue that. They have died not from any defense in terms of weaponry, anything clever. It's the fact, the one thing they didn't realize, the Martians that is, that man's bacteria that we have built up our own immune systems to, they are not immune from. And it is over the course of this whole story, it's entered their systems and it eventually kills them. The epilogue then represents the complete opposite of dead London. It is upbeat. It's the returning of life as it was before the Martian invasion. But, aha, we then get to epilogue part two, and, um, well, we're left with um, the question hanging in the balance. Did they come back? Did they remain? We don't know. We're getting great pictures here at NASA Control Pasadena. The landing craft touched down on Mars 28 kilometers from the aim point. We're looking at a remarkable landscape littered with different kinds of rocks, red, purple. How about that, Bermuda? Epilogue part two, which is set in modern times at uh, NASA Control, is really our tongue-in-cheek way of saying uh, they may come back again. They may sort out how uh, the bacteria of man can be overcome. And let's not get too self-important about uh, our abilities to defend against anything. And the NASA control sequence is really a reflection of how NASA monitors the universe, so to speak. And suddenly, in a normal day of monitoring, uh, a flash, a green flash, is seen leaving Mars, just as we started the piece, as H.G. Wells did. It's a return of the Martians. And then suddenly, at the very end, the sound cuts off, and it's saying, we're in trouble once again. How about that, Bermuda? Fantastic. Look at that dune field. Hey, wait, I, I, I'm getting a no-go signal. All the voices of NASA control were, in fact, my dad. It wasn't the original plan. The original plan was that my dad and I would uh, talk to each other and do our Alfred Hitchcock, so to speak. Uh, and we actually recorded an attempt at exactly that concept. And the reality was my dad was a professional performer and actor, and my performance was that of a musician. I was crap. So I fired myself and my dad wound up doing all the voices and we just modified the sound so it sounded like different people talking, although they were all his. What's that flare? You see it? A green flare coming from Mars. Kind of a green mist behind it. It's getting closer. You see it, Bermuda? Come in, Bermuda. Houston, come in. What's going on? Tracking station 43, Canberra. Come in, Canberra. Tracking station 63. Can you hear me, Madrid? Can anybody hear me? Come in. Come in. Each side was mixed. It took about one week to mix each of the four sides. It was all manual mixing, and while Jeff Young had the control of the, the desk in the majority, there was, from my memory, myself on Jeff's left and uh, a, 
uh, Lawrence Deanna, who was his main assistant on the right, sort of doing all the bits that Jeff couldn't physically reach and control with his hands because it was essentially live mixing. We finished after about a month of mixing and left and we congratulated each other on a, a job well done. And a, a couple of days later, I received a call from Roger Cameron, who was not only a, a very highly uh, recognized engineer in his own right, but he rose within the AdVision ranks to become the manager of the whole studios. And he said, uh, Jeff, are you sitting down? I thought, uh, no, I'm not, Roger. What, what's the, you know, the problem? Thinking something of earth-shattering news was about to be sort of told to me. He said, well, I think you better sit down. I thought, oh my gosh, maybe Jeff Young's had a heart attack or something really serious. And uh, he said, well, you're not going to believe this, but our tape operator misidentified the entire fourth side as being outtakes and with a razor blade shredded right through them on the basis that in that days it was a procedure that anything that you didn't want to save was sliced up and chucked, chucked in the bin. And he misidentified the final master of take four with outtakes that we didn't want, and off they went. And he said, believe it or not, we even, uh, Jeff and I, Jeff Young and, and, and Roger, followed the trash truck to the, the area where they disposed of all this trash and tried to, to find these pieces of, of tape and see if they was at all you know, salvageable, and they weren't. And uh, I sort of took it quite lightly from, from memory. I thought, gosh, I was really expecting something, you know, dreadfully serious. And yes, of course, it's serious in context of the production, but uh, it could be remixed. And AdVision immediately offered me the studio time for free. And we spent another week remixing it, and it probably was better. Well, by the time I had finished everything, as probably most people who are involved in creativity, no matter what it happens to me, you're very frequently unsure whether all this work was worth it. And I was no different. I was totally unsure if somebody said it's a load of crap, I would have accepted it. And if somebody said it's really great, I would gladly have accepted that too. So my wife, Geraldine, chose to take the lead and presented them to the then chairman of uh, CBS UK. Uh, CBS had no commitment to release the album. What they had within their contract with me was uh, the right to receive it and for them to have about 30 days to assess it and to make a decision whether they wanted to release it. So it was a, a nail-biting period once it was handed in. 30 days felt like an awful long time. I, I had the feelings you know, of somebody who'd been coiled up for almost, uh, at that point, uh, two and a half years or so, making something with a team of people. There was a lot of passion and belief put into the whole making of the recordings and the paintings and the script and everything that went into it, but I really didn't know if it was gonna be accepted. Ultimately, 30 days passed, and the call came. It wasn't the call that I was expecting. It wasn't a yes or a no. It was, oh, can we have another 30 days to decide whether we want to release this? And then the call finally came in, uh, not only to say that they had uh, decided to pick up the contract, but it was one of the, those memorable days in, in one's own life as a professional that not only were they calling sort of contractually, but there was a queue of people from the, from the uh, a and R side, from the management side, it was just a queue of people that just one after the other got on the phone to say, Jeff, you've done something special here with you and everybody involved in it. We believe in this big time and we think it's going to happen in a very big way all over the world. The, the War of the Worlds in sales has sold in its different forms about 13 million records to date. It won two Ivor Novello Awards, which are UK-based awards and they are mostly for writers and it's pretty much the the top award you can get as a writer so i was very proud of receiving those and then about a year or so later it won the best recording in science fiction and fantasy in the united states uh, the judges included steven spielberg george lucas and alfred hitchcock uh, the irony though is that the award was as if it was for the best soundtrack to a movie but of course it was a record, and I don't think any of the judges or anybody in that whole organization realized there was no movie attachment. But it was an award that I won and, and quite pleased with it. Would I do it all over again? Sure, of course I would. If you have something that you feel passionate about, it'll always be passionate to you. Um, it would be different because of, uh, if you're talking about doing it today, then it would be different because of so many things that have changed technologically. But yeah, the, the core of it would be the same. I'd probably approach 
My compositions and the orchestrations, the production values, very similarly. Um, and I would welcome to be able to work with the same people that I did again. So, absolutely. The chances of anything coming from Mars are millions to one. But still, they come. When I started working on The War of the Worlds, I was a single guy with the biggest challenge of my career in front of me. Today I'm married with four wonderful children and look back with great pride of a work that has enjoyed success all over the world. While some of those who I worked with are now no longer alive, our work lives on and continues to be rediscovered by new generations. But without HG and his incredible vision, this collaboration of talents would never have happened for me. So thanks, HG.